you very much, uh, Tony. Good morning. Uh, I speak here today with some humility, uh, given that I come from a country which is not a good advertisement for European enthusiasm at the moment. And I participated in a government which was very enthusiastic itself about the European Union, which uh, did a lot in a leading role in the European Union, but which presided over declining support for the European Union. Um, I want to make two points by way of context. The first is that it's always tempting for Europeans to look inwards. But if we look outwards, there is a global debate about legitimacy and efficiency today. The debate about state capitalism in China or in Russia is a debate about the balance between legitimacy and efficiency. The debate about gridlock in the United States or in India, those are both debates about the balance between legitimacy and efficiency, or efficacy, which I think is a better word, probably. The European Union's debate about legitimacy and efficacy is very important, and it has a particular character, because the European Union, previously the European Economic Community, was founded not on the principle of one person, one vote, but on the principle of one nation, one vote. The dual nature of legitimacy in the European Union arises from the fact that there are two guiding accountabilities, one to nations and the second to people. And I think it's very important that we are clear whether we want that to continue, which people like me think is essential, or whether a move towards a simple one-person, one-vote accountability system is the uh, future. I think that's essential by way of a first point of context, and I would just say, to be provocative, the problem at the moment is that too much of what the union does is neither legitimate nor efficient, and that is the danger zone in any political system. Secondly, though, I'd like to make a point of context that is never made in this debate, but which I think is critical. The so-called crisis of European institutions is not the only crisis or challenge at the moment. The truth about the lack of citizens' approval of the European institutions is it is also matched by a declining confidence among citizens in the traditional political ideologies of the Western world. Both Christian democracy, that word has a, a, a difficult history in this country, but the politics of the center-right but also the traditional politics of the center-left, which I represent, social democratic politics, both of these brands of politics, one standing for more market, the other standing for more state, neither of them appear very convincing to many of our voters at the moment. And I think it's very important to recognize that the declining confidence in European institutions is matched by declining trust in national institutions too. I mean, we are meeting in Italy, and I don't want to uh, teach an Italian audience about Italian politics, but the loss of confidence in Italian politics predated the loss of confidence in European institutions. So we are facing, I would say, uh, an important challenge on the ideological front as well as on the institutional front. That is by way of context. My main point to you is to plead with you to recognize that the delivery deficit in the European Union is much more significant than the democratic deficit. If we spend the next 10 years trying to solve the democratic deficit, we will fail. If we spend the next 10 years trying to address the delivery deficit, there is a chance that we could succeed. The truth is, if you wanted to design a cocktail of Euroscepticism, you would suggest an eight-year constitutional negotiation process you would suggest a macroeconomic policy that is inappropriate because it's pro-cyclical. You would suggest a microeconomic policy that is unbalanced between North and South. You would suggest political institutions that are not very good at reforming themselves. The cocktail of Euroscepticism has been very precisely designed. And it seems to me that the antidote, the medical antidote to Euroscepticism is founded in, on improved delivery, on the youth unemployment agenda that uh, President Monti mentioned. Energy policy is a classic case where the interdependence of the European Union speaks to 
a, an agenda for us all. Migration, which Commissioner Malmstrom is going to speak to later, a quintessential issue for the 28. And I would plead with this audience to uh, develop and discuss an agenda for a Europe of 28, not just a Europe of 17 within the Eurozone. Because the truth is that the Euro crisis continues, that the European Union is threatened by a failure to resolve the Euro crisis, but it's also the case that if it's resolved in certain ways, it could actually threaten the Europe of 28. And countries like Poland, Denmark, Sweden, never mind the United Kingdom, have a lot to offer to a Europe of 28, even if they're not in the Euro. Final point, because we've been asked to speak uh, briefly, or less than our allocated 10 minutes. Final point. It's true that when we're sitting in Britain or Italy or France and Germany, we think about a narrative of looking backwards towards the end of war between the countries of Europe. But that is not the only narrative that exists in the European Union today. The second narrative, and that is a narrative very strong in Eastern Europe, which are also the places where Europe is the most popular, the second narrative is about the reunification of Europe. The fall of the Berlin Wall, the end of communism, is as significant in the future uh, understanding of the strength of the European Union as the end of the Second World War and the reconciliation between France and Germany. However, neither of those two narratives, the peace between the countries of Western Europe, the reunification with the East, are sufficient. And our narrative for the 21st century must surely be the protection and improvement of European livelihoods in a globalized world. The youth unemployment agenda, there are 27 million unemployed across the OECD, 72 million across the uh, young people unemployed across the world. The energy issue is the subject of a resource crunch right across the Middle East, not just in uh, Europe. We've got to see the problems we address in a global uh, context, and it seems to me that the virtues of resilience, of strong institutions, of democratic accountability that do exist in the European countries today uh, should be a source of strength. And I, I just make this final point. Uh, with the greatest of respect to my two um, speakers who've spoken already, I was wondering why that phrase, too big to fail, left me with a, um, a worrying feeling. And then I suddenly remembered. Too big to fail is what people said about the Soviet Union in the 1970s and the 1980s. It's, we, we cannot be uh, complacent about, I see that uh, Foreign Minister Bonino has uh, arrived, uh, of all these sources of inspiration in the European uh, project at the moment, she is certainly uh, one of them, and she will remember this debate as, uh, as well. Complacency can be no basis for action in the modern world. This is a world where people do want results, uh, as well as accountability. They're right to ask for it. And it seems to me that it's the delivery deficit that we have to focus on if we are to rebuild confidence in the ability of Europeans to have decent livelihoods in the 21st century. Thank you very much indeed.